Okay, seven. Good evening, everybody. This is Mike Conway, the Arizona Geological Survey uh, or Society in this case. Uh, we'll give another minute or two. We're running up on 49, 51 people. So let's give it just one more minute. We'll get started. Okay. Hey, Tim, you are not muted. Is that right? I think I'm not. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Everyone else is muted at this point. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started then. Um, welcome everybody to the Arizona Geological Society's September evening presentation. Before I introduce Dr. Tim Marsh, just a couple of logistics. Uh, everybody is muted at this point, with the exception of Tim and myself, and I'll mute myself in just a moment or two. So please stay muted during the presentation. If you do have questions, uh, you'll find the chat down at the bottom of the screen and you'll be able to put those questions in the chat so you won't have to remember them all throughout the, the, the session and you'll have them there. Tim will have them there to address during the question and answer period, which will occur immediately after, after the event. Uh, let me see, is John Whittier out there someplace? John is, by the way, John is our the president of the Arizona Geological Society. I don't see him, so I'm going to have to say he's not. So I'll just go ahead and kick it off. Again, thank you all for joining us. And let me introduce Tim Marsh very quickly to you. Dr. Marsh has a 30-year career in mine geology and exploration with a focus on porphyry copper deposits. He's the former chief geologist of Resolution Copper Company. Formerly of, formerly of Rio Tinto Company, where he helped drill some of the first deep drill holes into what is now considered to be America's largest copper deposit. Along the way, he's earned a, a Bachelor of Science in Geological Engineering from the Colorado School of Mines and a PhD from Stanford University in ore deposits and exploration. Tim, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you at this point. Good. I'll I'll take a second and make sure to, to recognize uh, Dr. Mansky there, the, the guy that uh, did a much bigger part of finding resolution. I, I helped drill some of the, the holes into it, but Mansky did the, the brain work to find the thing, him and Don Hammer, and Alex Paul. Uh, but uh, I, I had the honor of getting a look at their discovery. And uh, really it was, it was being told by Rio Tinto that, that I had the opportunity to grid drill resolution on 75 meter centers that uh, got me interested in doing something else. And that, that was looking for the next one rather than uh, spending an entire career drilling six and 7,000 foot holes on 75 meter centers. So uh, in, in the early part of 2022, Bell Copper, uh, has, uh, in my mind, succeeded in finding a new big porphyry copper deposit. And I hope to uh, hope to convey that tonight, not uh, not just by me saying so, but hopefully some of the information I'll be able to share will uh, convince you that we're on to something new and something big. Very good. 
Jim, do you want to uh, begin your PowerPoint from the from the beginning? Yeah. So we just see that main slide. It, yeah. So I I, I got to start out with this to uh, satisfy the lawyers. Oh. Uh, the best way I can summarize it is uh, I, I am a uh, habitual liar. <laughs> Everything I'm going to say tonight should be uh, taken with uh, a lot of salt. I'm the guy that Mark Twain tried to warn you about, uh, the liar standing next to a hole in the ground. My holes are usually only a few inches in diameter, but uh, really you can't rely on anything I say to uh, do anything, and especially don't give me any of your money expecting to get it back. Uh, the, the story tonight takes place up in Northwest Arizona uh, on a, a linear trend of porphyry copper deposits that includes Resolution, includes Baghdad, Mineral Park, and another project that Bell Copper has been working on for a long time that's been renamed Perseverance. I used to call it Kaba after the Kaba mine. But these two uh, projects that Bell Copper now has are sandwiched in between Mineral Park on the Northwest and uh, Baghdad on the Southeast. Tim, can I stop you for a minute? Yes, sir. You're still on your title slide. Is that where you want to be? Nope, I'm about uh, two slides in now. Yeah, but uh, all we see, I think, is your title slide. So you're probably going to have to um, basically get the PowerPoint going from the beginning slide and, and go forward or manually move them forward. I'm on my second slide now. Have you seen anything change? No, we just see the first slide. Not quite sure how to change anything. Uh, let me ask somebody, anybody want to unmute themselves? Oh, here we go. The forward-looking statement just came up. Okay, I've gotten back to that one. Yeah, you're at the forward-looking statement now, which I think you just went through a moment ago. That's right. That's where Tim Marsh is a liar. Don't trust yeah, me. Yeah, that was, that was the one, Tim. Okay. Now we should be looking at a map of the Western U.S. Not yet. Still looking at the forward-looking statement. And that... Uh, I've got a little uh, a little soda straw of a connection that seems hmm. to be taking its uh, nothing, huh? Nothing. Uh, you perhaps could go down on the on the left hand on your left hand side. I guess it would be simply go down to the third slide and select that, and let's see if it comes up. Okay. Because right now you have the second slide selected. That did it. That did it. Well, that's the way I guess we'll progress. Yeah, I'm going to keep. Uh, I'm going to keep those uh, little thumbnails on the left side then. Okay, then that's the way to progress. Okay. Just select the slides as you need to. All right. So again, northwestern Arizona, Mojave County. Bell has two systems we've been exploring. Uh, Perseverance used to be called Caba, and uh, now Big Sandy. Uh, we're we're in. Elephant country for sure. 10% uh, of every pound of copper in existence in the world has come out of Arizona in the past about 120 years. Uh, there's a lot more we think to be found and uh, we, we think we're, we're part of that process. Uh, here, here's a uh, table of really big porphyry copper deposits. Porphyry copper deposits are are uh, one of the biggest reservoirs of, of metal on earth. Good things to find. Uh, they last a long time. They're big. They got a lot of metal in them. The, the big ones have been in production for 120 years now. And uh, one way of measuring them is by, by uh, mapping out the distribution of pyrite. More than any other element that they have in them, it's uh, sulfur that, that makes them uh, geochemically anomalous. And uh, so just measuring the distribution of pyrite in a, in a system gives you some sense of, as to how big it might be. Uh, big Sandy, the pyrite shell there is uh, six by five kilometers, Perseverance five by three kilometers. And we know that because we can walk around on the, on the bottoms of these deposits. And, and I would argue that in life, you can judge a lot of things about how good the tops will be if you can get a peek at the bottom. Uh, at Big Sandy and Perseverance, uh, they're exposed in the 
in the uh, Wallapai Mountains. And they've been known for over a hundred years and geologists have drilled a lot of holes in, in both of them. Uh, Big Sandy, the root zone there is, is Diamond Joe, the Diamond Joe Peak uh, area. And uh, at Perseverance, the, the root uh, was, was known as the Wheeler Wash Porphyry System. They're giant systems. And, and uh, the guys at University of Arizona mapped them back in the 70s and wrote theses on them. Uh, Philip Gurla at uh, Diamond Joe and uh, John Vujic at, at Wheeler Wash under the tutelage of, of Spence Titley and John Gilbert. And uh, they, they showed that these were big porphyry copper systems. And they drilled and they drilled. And the only advice I would have given them uh, if I'd have been around back then was to, to point your drills up. Uh, you're underneath where the copper shell ought to be. The copper shell is up in the air or was up in the air where the air is today. And basin and range faulting has uh, shifted the more uh, prospective parts of the system out into the valleys. But by measuring the dimensions of the pyrite shell, uh, we can see that at uh, Diamond Joe and at, at Wheeler Wash, Big Sandy and Perseverance, uh, the, the size there argues that you ought to spend some time looking for the tops. And uh, but before I even started working at Resolution, I had the idea of, of going out uh, uh, in the Big Sandy Valley and looking for the chopped off tops of uh, the Diamond Joe and, and Wheeler Wash porphyries. You can see by the size of the pyrite shells, they stack up well with the the biggest porphyries on earth. So here, uh, Big Sandy, this is uh, on the east side of the Big Sandy River. If you're driving from, from uh, Phoenix to Gis, you drive through Wikiup, about 10 miles north of Wikiup. If you look off to the right, you might see a little bit of evidence that I've been scratching around in the hills there looking for copper. That was, uh, God be drilling's uh, core rig, a Titan II drill that's uh, now successfully drilled to 6,600 feet for Bell. Little plug there for God be drilling. They did a good job for me. So again, by looking at the bottom of these systems, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the right things have happened. Uh, there are Laramide intrusions. You see this. Uh, you, you guys seeing, uh, let me see, I'm going to click that again. You look at looking at a map with uh, kind of an aerial photograph with some red outlines on it. Yep. You seeing that? Okay. So this, this outline on the left is the Diamond Joe uh, Porphyry, six kilometers by five kilometers. You can see a, a fantastic uh, array of radial fractures, uh, concentric fractures, uh, really centered on the uh, the apex, the central apex of that in, intrusion. It's been well dated, well studied. It's been drilled by all kinds of people. Inspiration copper in the, in the late 50s, Gulf minerals for a long time in the late 70s into the 80s, and as recently as about 2010 by Freeport back near the Leviathan mine. Uh, this area was, was uh, historically productive for Mali. Back in World War I, it produced them for you know thing hard hard things that they threw around in World War One from the Leviathan mine. So there's there's a lot of quartz, there's a lot of potassic alteration, a lot of sericitic alteration, all the things we like to see in porphyry copper deposits, rocks that have been dated at 74 million years, all the right things uh, except for a, a economic copper shell. And again, if if I could have been around when uh, say Gulf was drilling drill in that area, I would have said point the drill up because we're, we're underneath the copper shell. We need to, to get to some point in the, in the system that's a, a few kilometers shallower. Because of basin and range faulting, that, that location is somewhere off to the east under gravel. Uh, when I started getting some, uh, uh, some confirmation by drilling further north, uh, up around the Cabo mine area, that this, this model was kind of working out, uh, I, I took a stab early on, a little too close to the range front fault. Drilled some deep holes, never, never got out of gravel. Went 3,000 and 4,000 feet in gravel. Uh, didn't, didn't find uh, anything resembling bedrock, but I saw some porphyry altered fragments and uh, some native copper. Uh, that effort uh, you know, met with failure after uh, we didn't have enough money to keep the claims paid for. But 
but the idea stayed uh, firmly in mind. Interestingly, in 1980, the uh, uh, the Nuri program, Department of Energy and USGS went out and drilled a, a 5,000 foot hole a little further east of where I drilled. Uh, they, they also never got uh, down to bedrock, uh, but uh, I don't think they did it, but I've panned the cuttings from that hole and there's native copper in those cuttings. So there's a large patch of uh, fill out in that valley that's got native copper floating around in the gravel and that uh, kept me interested. Uh, in 20, let's see, uh, the, the, uh, the system we've got up to the north, we call it Perseverance now, it's, it's under option to a Robert Friedland company, Cordoba Minerals, who uh, has done a little bit of work there. Uh, they helped us drill one of our last holes and uh, they've subsequently drilled another hole, but the pace of play was uh, intolerably slow. Uh, them working on our project. Uh, so uh, I got impatient. I said, well, let's go try the next one to the south again. But uh, that was that was guided by new information that uh, previous uh, previous joint venture partner, Rio Tenno on the, on the uh, Perseverance project had showed us that the, there were chargeable electrically conductive rocks uh, much further out into the valley than I would ever have guessed. And so that, uh, that allowed me to, to be a little more bold about how far the, the hanging wall of that wallopi fault might have slipped. And uh, Bell in, in early 2020 began staking on the east side of Highway 93 and even on the east side of uh, the Big Sandy River to try and find that uh, decapitated top. Uh, we staked 260 claims, uh, picked up some uh, state mineral exploration permits, as we got out on that ground and began looking at the, uh, the gravel, you actually see exotic copper bubbling up the faults that cut the gravel in quite a few places. Uh, you find uh, transported copper bearing fragments in, in some of the more distal uh, uh, fanglomerate class on the east. It, it became pretty clear there were things in that gravel that uh, just weren't represented by what's available back in the foot wall, much higher grade copper bearing uh, minerals, all types of uh, quartz veining, biotitic alteration, just things that you like to see in a good porphyry copper deposit that were present in the gravel on the east side of the valley that just weren't represented back there in the, in the football. So it, it was clear that there was some source for the gravels on the east that uh, really supported the idea that a, a more copper rich top to this system existed and was, was leaking its copper uh, through a, an active modern groundwater system back up to the modern ground surface, uh, cementing in some places the, uh, the valley filling gravel. In July of 2020, uh, Bell got uh, Quantec out on the ground and Quantec ran a magnetotelluric survey. Uh, that, that survey showed a large electrical conductor that was real encouraging under, uh, well, they showed it probably cresting at about 400 meters below surface. Uh, we, we haven't found that shallow spot yet by drilling, but uh, we, we started drilling the, uh, the north side of that anomaly with our first hole. And after uh, about 900 meters of gravel, uh, we broke into uh, a porphyry system, looked like a, a fine grained uh, uh, granodiorite porphyry. BS1, our first hole cut that system somewhere near the inside edge of the, the propolytic environment. Uh, and that location is about 13 kilometers east northeast from, from the Diamond Joe stock. So we, we moved a long ways out into the valley, drilled blind through, through uh, nearly 900 meters of gravel. And underneath that gravel were rewarded with rocks that had uh, quartz veins, uh, molybdenite crystals, chalcosite, a little bit of chalcopyrite, uh, more, more zinc than I wanted to see, uh, but all the features that uh, are characteristic of a porphyry copper system. These are the, some, some, some of the pieces of uh, evidence. I've changed slides now. You should see some uh, core with native copper on the fractures. Are you seeing that? Nope. No. Nope? okay. There we go. Got it, okay. So some of the early drilling showed uh, native copper in the gravel. So that was encouragement that 
Sometime after the gravel was deposited, nature began leaking copper rich water up through the fractures in the gravel. This is kind of Gila, Gila type gravel, uh, 10, probably maximum 15 million years old based on the age of the underlying uh, peach spring tuff and, and uh, basalt. And I was able to uh, correlate some of the, the Precambrian class, uh, kind of an Aquarius megachristic uh, granite, uh, finding very similar looking uh, propolitically altered pieces of, of this Precambrian granite uh, 13 kilometers apart. So I felt I had uh, a slip direction and approximate magnitude fairly well established prior to uh, drilling this hole fairly blindly through, through gravel. Again, I mentioned uh, exotic copper. That's, that's one of the tells that there's something important in the subsurface at Big Sandy. This funny looking black rock looks like a piece of asphalt and it is just, just valley filling gravel that's been cemented by uh, neodocite. This piece runs about 1% copper and uh, about, I don't know, 10% manganese. So it's a manganese copper oxide that uh, glues the uh, the gravel together along particular young faults uh, at, at the elevation of the Big Sandy River. So it's fairly recently in the geologic past, there's been a metal rich groundwater discharging to surface. It's not happening today, but fairly, fairly uh, young sediments that are glued together with this copper saying that, uh, hey, it's worthwhile getting underneath the gravel and seeing what's producing this copper. Uh, this, this black stuff looks a lot like what you see uh, downstream of Chukikamata in the Exotica deposit. Uh, as uh, again, as we got out on the ground, we began finding uh, mineralized fragments in the uh, fairly young valley filling gravel. You see uh, all the kinds of veins you like to see in porphyry copper deposits, A veins, D veins, uh, forming a, a particular fan uh, about roughly a kilometer on a side. This is uh, far to the east. So it suggested there might be an upthrown block under relatively shallow gravel cover out in the middle of that valley, shedding these mineralized copper rich fragments. Uh, another thing I like to look at anytime I'm exploring is uh, what, what sorts of heavy minerals are associated with the, uh, the gravels. So what, what you find in these these gravel deposits are zircons that look like they came out of a laramide porphyry. Uh, not not the, the purple square cross-section zircons you see in a lot of the Precambrian rocks, but uh, more champagne colored, uh, ornately faceted uh, zircons typical of uh, productive laramide porphyries in Arizona. And the, the angularity of the, the copper bearing fragments suggested hey, these things hadn't hadn't washed uh, 13 kilometers out of the foot wall that uh, they had formed in a fan much closer to the foot wall and been transported to their, their current location in the hanging wall of a fault. I think the, I think the lifetime of a, of a boulder in the bottom of the Colorado River, uh, bouncing down the Colorado River is about 10 miles. So a boulder that falls off the wall of the, the canyon, say it's a, a good Precambrian boulder, uh, doesn't doesn't make it much more than ten miles before it's it's gone. So uh, these things, thirteen kilometers out from the the range front, probably didn't roll there in debris flows. Uh, they'd have been pulverized in the process, I would imagine. But it just it argued for a uh, a much more proximal source, and uh, that was enough to get me drilling. Uh, we did run this uh, this magnetotelluric survey. Quantech ran it and it showed a, a very unusually strong electrical conductor. Uh, to this day, I can't tell you why that uh, patch of ground is uh, electrically conductive, but its uh, uh, resistivity is on the order of uh, 10 to 15 ohm meters in an area two and a, two and a half, about two and a half by two kilometers, uh, situated adjacent to this uh, copper bearing fan conglomerate. And uh, just the, the two things seem spatially related uh, enough that, that, I, that I imagined in uh, my wildest dreams that uh, there, there is a genetic relationship between the two things, this electrical conductor and this pile of uh, porphyry copper fragments. So by, uh, I think it was about October, 2020, we 
got, got me drilling up there and started drilling away. So after 900 meters of drilling, we found a core that uh, should be looking at some zircons under a microscope. Let's see if I can make sure where we're looking at here. Do you see in uranium lead zircon dating? Yeah, that's what we're seeing. All right. So there's a piece of core uh, on the right, a semicircular segment of a circle piece of core from about 900 meters down at granodiorite. And then an outcrop to the left of that uh, from the Diamond Joe stock. So our core hole and the Diamond Joe stock are 13 kilometers apart. Uh, over uh, the Christmas of 2020, I picked the zircons out of both of them sent them up to the University of Idaho for dating and the ages came back 74.2 and 74.9, both of them plus or minus about a million years. Uh, so they're indistinguishable in age. So at, at least permissibly, I had found uh, the top of something the same age as, as Diamond Joe, which is really what I set out to do and hopefully with some copper in it. Uh, what's also interesting about this dating exercise, uh, the, the much older uh, zircons that were present with the Laramide zircons were roughly the same proportions of, of old Precambrian, 1.4 and 1.6 billion year old Precambrian uh, xenolithic zircons in these samples. So they, they seem to be uh, rocks that formed uh, permissibly from the same, the same uh, porphyry intrusion. Should be looking at uh, slide 13. Drilling program, right? Okay. Yeah, so that's what we saw in, yeah, saw in that first intersection, once we got under uh, the oxidation was uh, calcasite, calcasite overprinting pyrite. Uh, down in the lower left, some coarse uh, molybdenite grains. Uh, these are about three millimeters across, very coarse, uh, real flashy molybdenite grains. I sent those to Holly Stein at Colorado State University. She called back and said, Tim, you about broke my uh, mass spectrometer. Uh, they ended up running 8,700 and 9,300 parts per million rhenium, which is nearly 1% rhenium in the molybdenite. But uh, globally, those are, those are extraordinarily high rhenium numbers. Uh, in terms of alteration, the, uh, the hole was kind of on the inside edge of the green rocks environment. We saw lots of D veins. Uh, complexly zoned D veins with sulfide center lines, mainly quartz pyrite, little calcopyrite, sphalerite center lines. Uh, but uh, we weren't quite in the environment I wanted to be in. We moved to the, moved to the south. Excuse me, I got a cough. <clears throat> we moved to the south, 1.6 kilometers off to the, the, the other side of the MT anomaly. Again, drilled uh, down into basement through uh, about 650 meters of gravel on our second hole. And uh, we drilled a lot of countertop rock, a lot of old Precambrian granite. It had some real interesting zoned uh, veins with, with epidote center lines, uh, some barite, a uh, little bit of calcopyrite on the center lines, but it was pretty clear we weren't in the environment I had dreamed of. Uh, so after making sure that that uh, we weren't gonna hit uh, the porphyry with that hole. We moved to the third hole, 1.2 kilometers west of BS1, our first hole. You can see we're doing very big step outs. I'm, I'm fishing blindly through a pretty thick cover. And BS3 uh, was a dream come true. So after about three months of drilling through gravel, uh, almost 4,000 feet of gravel. Uh, we broke out of uh, gravel into this rock, uh, very strongly seracitically altered uh, quartz vein bearing uh, quartz eye porphyry. Uh, the texture of the porphyry is almost uh, uh, in, indecipherable. Uh, the, the, the phenocrysts are essentially obliterated except for the quartz. It's got some quartz eyes in it. Uh, but it's really altered to uh, sericite on a, on a very pervasive scale. No sign of epidote, uh, very little 
very little to no uh, chlorite. So we had moved considerably into the, uh, the inner part of the system. Uh, quite a few quartz veins, uh, but just earthy, earthy red hematite primarily in, uh, in the, uh, the first 111 meters of, of leached cap. Uh, so I watched this come out of the ground day after day about through Thanksgiving of 2021, uh, dreaming what might be causing that hematite. I, I, have, I have an X-ray fluorescence analyzer, which I would, I would hit that uh, hematite with it all the time and uh, really saw very low copper numbers, 50, 60, 70 parts per million copper uh, in, the, in the earthy hematite, but it looked like fertile hematite to me, so we kept drilling. And at, uh, starting at 1,302 meters, uh, we began seeing calcocyte. The first, the first uh, lick of calcocyte ran over 4% copper, just 30 centimeters, but it was a, a good slug of calcocyte uh, showing that the hole needed to keep going. We drilled eventually 200 meters of uh, super gene enriched uh, calcocyte mineralization. That's calcocyte uh, rimming pyrite. I haven't seen anything that looks like a primary calcocyte. And really in that upper 200 meters, calcocyte was the only significant uh, copper bearing mineral. There uh, wasn't any, uh, well, it wasn't any copper oxides, no blues and greens. It just went straight from uh, the red, earthy red hematite down into calcocyte. And that's my uh, fax machine ringing there in the background. Sorry for that. I'm now looking at slide 17. Tell me when you see it. It's up. Yep, it's up. All right, so uh, assay results. We cut 200 meters between 1302 and 1502 meters, averaging 0.42% copper, 8.4 pounds per short ton, along with 2.4 grams of silver. And there was a somewhat richer interval of 54 meters grading 0.67% copper and 3.7 grams of silver. Uh, this, uh, this chunk of core I'm holding in my hand uh, ran about 2.1% copper, one of the very few intersections or assay intervals that uh, ran over 1% copper. Most of it was just pretty boring, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5% copper as finely disseminated, uh, just pep very light peppering of calcocyte. Uh, the brassy, shiny veinlet running through there is pyrite that's, that's crisscrossed with late uh, kind of crackle texture, uh, calcocyte veinlets cutting through it. Uh, more important is that dark gray vein up above the brassy one. That's just pure calcocyte that's taken out of a pyrite vein. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, out of that 200 meters, uh, just three assays that ran over 1% copper. Down to slide 18. This is a pretty typical picture of uh, the texture, photomicrograph. Field of view, there's about seven millimeters. Uh, the grains of pyrite are roughly a millimeter across, but they've got a dark gray, silver gray rim of calcocyte surrounding the pyrite. It's just a good old super gene enriched uh, calcocyte. You can see the, the texture of the porphyry is, is pretty much obliterated. You can make out a quartz eye there, a few quartz eyes. Most of the rest of the porphyry is just, it's muscovite. Now I'm down to slide 19. Correct. Right. Uh, once we got out of the, uh, the super gene calcocyte at about 1,502 meters, I kept going because there were plenty of sulfides in the, in the interval. Uh, we drilled about 700 meters, 700 meters from the, uh, the top of the, the super gene enrichment down to the bottom of the hole at 2,026 meters where the pyrite content averaged around 10 weight percent. So maybe five volume percent pyrite. Uh, that's, that's a lot of pyrite. Uh, a lot of sericite from top to bottom. This this drill interval, about 800 meters, is nothing but sericite quartz. Very few intervals where you actually see the original texture of the porphyry. 
just myriads of D veins, uh, a, a patch of a patch of core maybe the size of one or two fists in that 800 meter interval where you could see kind of uh, caramel brown phlogopitic biotite, uh, pervasive shreddy biotite, but most of that was completely uh, overprinted. If it had been present on a larger scale, it's just completely been overprinted by the sericitic alteration, the pyrite mineralization. Uh, the copper that's in that uh, deeper interval below the, the supergene enrichment is mainly in the form of calcopyrite, a little bit of tenantite, uh, probably less than 10% of that copper uh, is, is carried by tenantite, a little bit of sphalerite and uh, trace molybdenite, but really the, the sulfide uh, of predominance is pyrite over that interval. And that all, all together, it tells me I haven't found the place I'm looking for. I want to find that super gene enrichment blanket where it sits right on a copper shell. And I think I need where to be looking for it. That uh, interval of primary mineralization underneath the, the calcocyte, the 524 meters below 1502, average 0.16% copper, a very uh, monotonous 0.16% copper. It would tick up a couple of tenths and, or a couple of hundredths and down a couple of hundredths uh, and 2.2 grams of silver, but uh, overall a, a pretty monotonous sequence of sericitized porphyry. And, and in all of BS3, 800 and, and uh, whatever meters, uh, nothing in there but laramide looking porphyry. I haven't dated anything out of BS3 yet, but there's no Precambrian, uh, nothing but uh, porphyritic rocks that all look about the same, um, roughly quartz monzonite composition and uh, kind of a porphyritic affinitic texture with, uh, you know, the usual characters, a few uh, prominent case bars every now and then, uh, uh, quartz eyes are, are present in most of it. And if the alteration hasn't taken out a little bit of uh, primary biotype, but most of that's been destroyed by sericitic alteration. Uh, the average ratio in that deep interval of calcopyrite, uh, pyrite to calcopyrite is, is 20 to one. It's very, very pyrite dominant. So I didn't, I didn't get to the, the place I wanted. You see the piece of core from the bottom of the hole, 66, 48 feet, uh, got a lot of pyrite in it, uh, very sericitized. And uh, as you can tell the way the presentation's going, I don't have the bandwidth to, uh, to show you a lot more core, but I, I put uh, about 80 boxes of core into a presentation uh, with uh, the girl from Ipanema as the background music. And I was gonna run you for about five minutes from top to bottom through BS3 and let you share in the dream that I experienced uh, between about November of 2021 and uh, March of 2022 as we drilled this hole. Each day was a, was a, a dream come true seeing this stuff come out of the ground. We've got, uh, got more to do, but uh, we were seeing the right things. Now, I always knew if I ever got something resembling ore in a, in a core sample, I was going to get it in and, and make sure it would come out easily. So we sent the, uh, the assayed interval from BS3 into uh, SGS Lakefield up in Ontario and had uh, froth flotation and acid leach testing done on the calcocyte. Turns out it, it uh, does pretty good. Uh, we, we recovered 80 plus 80% 80 of the copper into a concentrate grading 25% copper and uh, 160 grams of silver. Uh, so that worked pretty good. Uh, mineralogically, SGS looked at it uh, with their, their Tima X system. They say 75% of the copper is in the form of calcocyte, 15% is bornite. Uh, I, I would argue that the bornite is probably idaite, probably a, a copper iron sulfide that's uh, uh, supergene rather than, than hypogene in, in origin. Uh, we'll find out, but uh, essentially none of the copper was as a, a oxide copper mineral. Went straight from, from earthy hematite down into uh, supergene calcocyte. Uh, Quartz are the dominant uh, gain species. Carbonate minerals are very sparse at about a tenth of a, a weight percent. And uh, so that opens up the avenue for uh, leaching this stuff with acid without losing acid. Uh, here, the bulk, the bulk uh, cleaner concentrate on the flotation testing graded 25% copper, 130 grams per ton silver. We lose a bit of the silver in the flotation, but roughly it tracked with the, uh, the calcocyte. Uh, 
uh, we ran uh, ferric leaching, 30 gram per liter sulfuric acid on, on ground ore. So this isn't really representative of a, an in situ uh, process, but we found we could get plus 96% of the copper out by leaching it with sulfuric acid. Uh, we also found that the sample itself generated uh, free acid during the leaching process. So we don't have an acid consuming environment. Uh, we've got a, an acid, uh, acid generating environment, which uh, would make it a little more amenable to uh, an in situ idea if uh, the bulk rock will also leach. Uh, there, there was very little molybdenite in the, the super gene enrichment zone, but I asked SGS to try and make a concentrate. They, they did pretty good given, given that they were given a rock that had very little molly in it. Uh, they made a concentrate grading 20.7% molly, and they think they could do a lot better if I could actually give them some good uh, molybdenite in the rock. But I really, really wanted to know what's the rhenium grade. If we move 1.2 kilometers from that nearly 1% rhenium, that we saw in BS1, uh, what's, the, what's the rhenium grade in the molybdenite? And uh, they said, hey, if we could make a 50% concentrate out of what you gave us, it would grade approximately 1,700 grams per ton rhenium, or about 0.17% in a, in a typical molycon grading 50%. So it gives us hope that uh, when, once we get out into a more moly rich environment, uh, rhenium will be uh, an economically significant part of, uh, of what we're finding. Got some Tima X images of calcocyte grains. Uh, this is the stuff I really love. Uh, electron microscope imaging, you know, really thousands of calcocyte grains from our, for our BS3 sample. So you can see mineral associations. And, and mm -hmm. by, by grinding to minus, uh, minus 100 microns, uh, 80 microns, 40 microns, you get some real nice clean calcocyte grains. And it gives me confidence that with a bit more metallurgical testing, we could make a, a better better concentrate than 25% copper, which which isn't good. I think most smelters today would be real happy to be getting a, a clean calcocyte 25% concentrate. Uh, this is the main diluent in a, in the concentrate. That's clean pyrite grains. It floats just like the calcocyte. SGS spent a little bit of effort trying to suppress the the pyrite. They, they cleaned it up to 25%, but again, the main diluent there is pyrite adds some heat to the smelter, keep the smelting process going, but uh, if, we, if we could clean it out, uh, that'd be good. But th there's, there's really not much, not much else in the concentrate. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of zinc, not seeing a lot of arsenic, not seeing, uh, you know, relic uh, calcal pyrite grains. Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm now down to slide 14. 24? Uh, I, uh, yeah, 24, there you go. Okay. So this is the interesting one, me, uh, the, the red there is pyrite. Uh, that second uh, tier of, of uh, grain images below that is uh, grains that are composite calcocyte and what SGS classified as bornite. If it's bornite, uh, that, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I, I hypothesize that it might be idaite rather than bornite, but any, anyhow, uh, there's really not much other than calcocyte, uh, this copper iron sulfide, bornite or idaite and pyrite. So it's a, it's a pretty nice looking concentrate, a good, uh, good reason to look for something cleaner. And uh, just about the end of it here, uh, this is what I imagine in the subsurface. Now in slide 25. You seen slide 25 yet? Yes, 25 is up. Okay, so here's a, here's a cross section uh, down through uh, plus one kilometer of, of Gila type gravel cover. Nice. You see off on the right, uh, BS2, the second hole I drilled, it cut a little uh, uh, tertiary basalt, probably 20 million year old basalt, just before going into uh, some pretty dry Precambrian. But again, that Precambrian is cut by veins with uh, uh, some phyllic envelopes, a lot of epidote on center lines of veins, uh, ferrite mineralization. Uh, then off on the left, uh, BS3, the, the curvature in that hole is, uh, is real. That's a gyroscopic survey. Uh, yeah. If we had to put a little Viagra in our mud, maybe we had to hit that hypothesized supergene enrichment blanket over the, the primary copper shell with the BS3, but it sagged on me and 
uh, we got a, a, a super gene enriched blanket that I think is uh, kind of hydrologically displaced from, from the source rock. I don't think the calcocyte that we see in BS3 really came from uh, the, the underlying primary, I think it was probably remobilized from something a little better just off to the side. And uh, consequently, I'd like to get a hole into that position. That seems pretty close, but it's a uh, 900 meter, more than a half a mile offset from the collar position. And it'll be more than a 500 meter offset uh, down at, uh, at depth. But I'm, I'm looking for a super gene enrichment blanket sitting on top of uh, where the main primary copper shell would have been with chalcopyrite, maybe some boronite uh, providing the, uh, the copper for that, that primary copper shell. And uh, I'd sure like to be drilling uh, uh, this month. I'm permitted there. I got my road built, I got my pad built and uh, I'm selling raffle tickets. So uh, <laughs> get, yours, get yours today and remember what I warned you about. Uh, uh, if you if you give me your money, you'll never see it again. All right, and and re remember back. I'm looking at slide. Uh, I don't know. It's the next one. Must be about 26, huh? Yeah, 26. Yeah. Landscape side. Yeah, with the drill rig. Re really, the thing that got me out at Big Sandy was the encouragement that we had seen. Uh, back at Perseverance or back at our, our Kaaba project out near kind of where Interstate 40 and, and Highway 93 come together. Uh, it was the encouragement from that uh, and, uh, you know, more recent drilling that's been done there. Just a quick review of what we've seen up on the Perseverance project. Uh, calcopyrite, bornite, potassium feldspar envelopes, D veins, cutting porphyritic rock that's dated as uh, Laramide in age, again, the same age as what we've drilled at, at Big Sandy, 70, 72 to 74 million years. So uh, we just haven't found the sweet spot to, at either one of them, but uh, we're, we're awful close, I think. A little bit of gold and, and some chrysocolla and a lot of leached capping out at, at Perseverance. But these are the, the kinds of things that got uh, uh, Cordoba Minerals uh, Robert Friedland's group interested and in, in, in eventually uh, taking an option. So they've got it. Uh, the steering wheel is in their hands. Bell, Bell wishes them good luck and, and Godspeed, and, and uh, I wish they would get after it. Uh, they've also got big MT, big MT anomalies, uh, slide, slide 29 now. So the, the kinds of uh, electrical anomalies that we've uh, found and drilled at Big Sandy with uh, positive results are present out there at, at Perseverance. And uh, I'd, I'd sure like to find the twin of, of what we found at Big Sandy at Perseverance. And that is the end. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk tonight. Uh, again, it's an honor and a privilege. And I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Hey, Tim, thanks so much. That was excellent. There are some questions in the chat. Do you want me to hand them off to you or can you see them? You should be able to find the chat yeah. down below at the bottom of the screen. If I scroll up to the top or down to the bottom? Uh, up towards the top, but the first three or four are uh, really not questions. I think uh, the first one comes in around 659 from Scott. 659, Mansky. Any coarse grained white mica grison? No grison. Everybody's hearing me, huh? Yes. Scott, no, no grison in the uh, in the drill core. Uh, lots of grison back in the footwall. Uh, so, some really spectacular grison, uh, centimeter scale muscovite flakes forming uh, essentially uh, a pigmatitic uh, sericitic envelopes. They're like giant D veins. If you could if you could uh, look under a microscope and look at D veins, this is what these. Uh, Grisons back in the uh, the Diamond Joe stock and the uh, the Wheeler Wash stock look like very coarse grisonous muscovite as envelopes on uh, pyrite centerline veins. Uh, um, this is Peter Domes. Uh, where's the water table in each of the three holes? It's uh, it's very near the surface. Uh, the, really, the first hole I drilled at Big Sandy, or that God be drilling drilled for me wasn't an exploration hole, it was a water well. And I would recommend that to anybody out there 
exploring in Arizona, you might uh, be better off drilling yourself a water well from hole one rather than uh, spending uh, spending a lot of fuel, diesel fuel, hauling water from miles away. But uh, we hit water 65 feet below surface in our water well on the east side of the uh, Big Sandy. Uh, the other holes we haven't, uh, you know, we've drilled those with mud, so we don't know the water water levels, but uh, it's very shallow. Uh, Mansky. Uh, the, the tilt on the system, the best evidence I got from tilt on the system is uh, by doing spear tests as we went down BS3. I tried a couple of times to get a, uh, a downhole televiewer, but uh, uh, the logger wasn't happy with the condition of the hole. But uh, by spearing the inclined core, I was able to measure uh, bedding angles. The, the steepest angles I measured were up to 42 degrees. Uh, and uh, yeah, westerly, west southwesterly is uh, uh, what I think the dip is. So, uh, and, and it fans. Uh, it's, it's only 12 to 15 degrees at the surface, and it fans uh, westward, uh, getting steeper, closer to bedrock, to a maximum of about 42 degrees. And uh, Eugene Schmidt, that is a sunrise, not a sunset. <laughs> uh, Thorny Rogers, the uh, pros and cons of MT. Uh, the the uh, the frequency of the of the signal is so low that the depth of penetration is very great, many kilometers, uh, just by sitting on the same station and, and observing for uh, literally days, uh, you can get uh, depths of investigation of tens of kilometers, even hundreds of kilometers. They 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 study the uh, the mantle with magnetotellurics, and so it's depth of penetration that's really the advantage of uh, magnetotellurics uh, IP wouldn't have shown us and, and hasn't. I've actually done some, some IP out there now. Uh, six, seven, 800 meters depth of investigation. Uh, you wouldn't have gotten down the sulfides uh, at Big Sandy. Uh, where is Perseverance? Where is the deposit? I wish I knew, but it's pretty close to the intersection of uh, Highway 93 and Highway 40, uh, about 15 miles east of Kingman. Uh, I, I, I answered a Tony's question, could it be mined in situ? I hope so. Uh, at least the, the very basic test, if you grind it up and throw it in a jug of acid, will, it, will the calcocyte dissolve? Yeah, plus 96% of the copper goes into solution. If you do that, you don't get moly, you don't get rhenium, you don't get silver. Uh, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's the best thing to do is just go, go and get that uh, copper. But what I'd like to do is find a sweeter spot and uh, justify going down and getting everything. Yeah, I might have skipped some there. Uh, uh, John Ward, what are Bell's plans? Plans are to go find a giant porphyry copper deposit and get stinking rich. <laughs> and that's uh, sooner than later. Uh, I think I've, oh, the general structural setting. Yeah, I, I would say uh, uh, there, there, there was probably a single important fault that's roughly the, the east face of the uh, uh, the Wallapai Mountains. There's been a bit of tilting, but man, when I can when I can see bedding angles, even up at Perseverance as deep as uh, as the basement, Perseverance isn't tilted more than 20, maybe 25 degrees. Uh, Big Sandy seems to be a bit more uh, in the in the low 40s. Uh, it's not a Urington kind of situation where the thing is where the, the the hanging wall is rotated 90 degrees by multiple stages of faulting. There's certainly multiple stages of faulting, but I think the, the faults as they rotate a little bit and slip a little bit, they get a lot slipperier and that coefficient of friction drops well below uh, intact rock coefficients of friction. And I think things end up sliding a lot further. That, that, that was an acceptable answer uh, 40 or 50 years ago and uh, became uh, kind of unacceptable. But well, if you go and you look at uh, natural systems where uh, extensions taking place. Uh, I think there's there's good evidence a lot of places that uh, these faults can move a long way at a very low angle, uh, aseismically, ace and generate a lot of uh, slippery clay in the process, and things can move a long distance. And really, that's what I think I'm finding. I'm finding the uh, the Diamond Joe system uh, 13 kilometers away without 90 degrees of of rotation. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad Johnson. Uh, the the Wallapai fault, I, I drilled it, uh, I'm quite confident of it, 
up at Perseverance in my first hole. It was a very bold step, uh, one mile east of the range front fault. I drilled 2,600 feet of gravel and drilled through a, a fault a couple of meters thick, and it was dipping at about 30 degrees at that location. Uh, so a couple of meters thick of fault gouge, gravel right on top of Precambrian. Uh, it looks like it slid a long ways, uh, slipperier than heck. Uh, you can see nice uh, lineations in it that suggest which way it might have slipped, but uh, a, a very a painfully obvious uh, big fault. That's what it looks like. But uh, if you go back in the in the wallop eyes uh, around the, the Diamond Joe stock, uh, I've never seen it at Diamond Joe. Uh, there's a couple of water wells that have been drilled through it. Uh, you don't you don't get much of a feel for what the fault looks like from the the water well cuttings, uh, but it's you know it's it's roughly where uh, where you start seeing laramide fragments sticking out of the ground uh, adjacent to big big boulders uh, from the, the old alluvial fans. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions after Brad Johnson. I I don't either. You know what we can do Tim is if you'll stop sharing your screen, we can. Uh get a look at everybody and, and see if people have questions that they want to unmute themselves and ask. Good. All right. Did you find that uh, you had enough exotic copper to maybe make a, a small pit in that material? I have not seen any place, a very small pit. I haven't seen any place where uh, uh, I, I would want to think about that yet. Uh, you, if you got a backhoe and a pickup truck, uh, you could dig most of these occurrences out. Hmm. Tim, I got a question for you. Um, that copper oxide, the leach cap that you've got there, is any of that just transported oxide or is it all uh, leach cap in place? I, I think it's mainly indigenous iron oxide derived from sulfides that used to be there, calcasite uh, and uh, pyrite. Okay. Tim, George Morgan. Hi, George. Uh, How are you doing? Yeah, doing fine. I see you're doing fine. Good talk. I assume the hell of the uh, fault you've got there is what we used to call the Lake Ranch Road fault. Uh, yeah, you bet it. And it's the one that uh, it's in a, a GSA abstract that we call the Wallapai fault. Okay. Tim, I've lost my I've lost my monitor, so um, I'm I'm look I'm I'm lost in the dark here. Uh, that was really excellent. Are there any last questions before we let Tim go? Great. Hey, thank thanks you very so much again. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim, for doing that. That was excellent. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Thank you for doing this. Thanks very much. Yeah. Good talk. Thanks. Will we get access to the uh, PowerPoint or will it be available on the Arizona Geolog Geologic Society uh, website? Yeah, ideally in a day or two, I got to confirm with Tim that he's okay with that, but otherwise that was the intent is to get it up there and make it available. And then we'll post that on social media and uh, send a note out to the AGS Society and others that it's up there. Yeah, yeah. you got my consent. Well. All right, Tim. Accelerate Excellent. that process. You got it. Very good. Thank you so much. You got it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.